So let's open with Happy Labor Day Eve, okay? Because that's, that's what we're faced with now, tomorrow being Labor Day. Some of us know what that is. Some of us don't, I'm finding out. Labor Day in the United States is a federal and public holiday, uh, and it's uh, celebrated on the first Monday in September every year. It honors the American labor movement. That's why it's called Labor Day. And it honors all the contributions and, uh, uh, that workers have made to, to strength, to prosperity in our country, uh, uh, all the way up to uh, just the foundational laws and well-being of the United States of America. It's all on the backs of all of us who've worked and have worked in the past. So the Monday uh, of the long weekend we call Labor Day weekend. That's Labor Day. So now you know. Now you know why you're celebrating, why you're doing what you're doing, and why we call it Labor Day. Uh, it, it's usually considered the official end of summer. So I guess tomorrow, after tomorrow, officially, summer's over, I guess. I guess. But I think, now understanding Labor Day, I think resting is one of the best ways to celebrate working. <laughs> you know? Of course, some of you do that on the job, I realize, but I meant separate from the job. Resting is one of the best ways to celebrate Labor Day. So whether you choose tomorrow to rest or whether you're choosing tomorrow just to be completely active to the point that you're going to need Tuesday off, we need to talk about rest today. Labor Day's to, uh, tomorrow we're celebrating, but today let's talk about rest. And our bulletin actually has the opening scripture on it, Mark 6:31. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, in talking about rest, there's images that come to mind immediately, uh, and we need to know that our communication today does include physical rest, but that's kind of an, uh, uh, a byproduct of what uh, rest is all about, really, what the rest that Scripture describes, okay, because it also consists, uh, rest in, in the Bible is an interruption of working. Stop working. Stop laboring, as you know, Labor Day. Stop working and take a rest. So there's a progression to this experience. You got to stop working first, just so you get that that communication, because that hit me really hard. And I cannot offer a word about rest from a scriptural point of view uh, without discussing the biblical word Sabbath. Why? Because that's what that word means. Rest. Sabbath. This comes from the Hebrew, Hebrew word, depending on who you're studying and who's teaching you, Shabbat, S-H-A-B-A-T, or S-A-B-A-T, but I've always said Shabbat. But the word actually means to rest or to stop or cease from work. Stop it. That's what that word actually, Sabbath, that's what that means. The origin of the Sabbath, which I hope we know by now, if we don't, we're about to find out, is for, goes all the way back to the, to the beginning in the Bible, then in creation. That, as it's recorded in Genesis 2 2, after creating the heavens and the earth in six days, God rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Now, this doesn't mean that God was tired. Doesn't mean that he was wore out and needed a rest. It means, and literally, practically, it just simply means God stopped working. He stopped his work and took a break. That's what it means. This brings us to another question for the pastor then. And the question is, does God require Sabbath keeping of Christians? And that's where we're going to try to dive into. There's no way I can cover this in I'll try to cover what's in my head, but there's just so much information. I'll try to hit the highlights as the Holy Spirit leads and also as, uh, as written down in my notes. But uh, does God require Christians uh, to be Sabbath-keeping Christians? Well, we know God requires us to rest. We know that. I mean, scientists, psychologists, your doctor's going to tell you these things as well. And that comes from God originally. But you need to take a break. You need to stop every once in a while. You have to or you're just going to run yourself into the ground. So God does require us to rest. He does require us to experience Sabbath, a day of not working. He does require that of us. And that's just for our well-being, if nothing else. 
but, but the application and comprehensive understanding of Sabbath, I think, is what needs to be clarified so that we can uh, answer the question, is, is Sabbath keeping required of modern-day Christians? So let's go into that. Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 17, this is what the Apostle Paul declares. Therefore, let no one judge you in regard to food and drink or in regard to the observance of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Such things are only a shadow of what is to come, and they have only symbolic value. But the substance, the reality of what is foreshadowed, belongs to Christ. Romans 14, 5 states, One person regards one day as better or more important than another, while another regards every day the same as any other. Let everyone be fully convinced, be fully assured and satisfied in his or her own mind. Now, there's other scriptures that go along with this, but I think that's enough information, enough empirical evidence to show you that it's clear for the Christian a day or one day of Sabbath keeping is a matter of spiritual freedom. And I hope you get that. It's a matter of spiritual freedom. It is not a matter of a new covenant commandment of God to work for our salvation. Sabbath is not a new covenant commandment from God for us to work. That's ironic to even think that we would even consider that, isn't it? Yeah, I want you to fulfill the Sabbath as a way to work for your salvation. That doesn't make sense. So it's not a new covenant from God to work out your salvation. A specific day of Sabbath keeping is an issue on which God's word clearly communicates and instructs us not to to condemn each other about. It's clear. Stop condemning each other. Sabbath keeping is a matter about which each person, each Christian needs to be fully convinced in his or her own mind about. What does that mean? It means what we've talked about many times before. It's a personal conviction now. It is not a new covenant work out your salvation commandment. Did you know some people think that keeping the Sabbath uh, affects your salvation? Did you know that? That's not what the new covenant says, but that's some people do that. I'm not condemning you. <laughs> you know, scripture tells me not to do that. In the early, early uh, uh, chapters of the book of Acts, the first Christians were predominantly Jewish. We've talked about this in GYB, so you've missed some of the foundational uh, uh, argument, foundational information for this presentation, but they were predominantly Jewish. When Gentiles began to receive this gift of salvation, which was unheard of uh, before this time, uh, but they received it through Jesus the Christ, well, the Jewish Christians were now starting to be, in, uh, be faced with this dilemma. What are we going to do? What aspects of this Mosaic law, what aspects of our culture and our tradition now should the Gentiles be instructed to obey? How much of this are we going to put on them? Because they don't know anything about it. You know, it's foreign to them. So how, what are we going to do about this? Well, the apostles met to talk about this and discussed all these issues in Jerusalem. It was called the Jerusalem Council. You can read about that in Acts chapter 15. After they met and discussed and, and laid everything out, the decision was pronounced in Acts uh, 15 verses 19 through 20. And here it is. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain uh, from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood, period. Sabbath keeping was not one of the commands the apostles felt was necessary to force on Gentile believers. Didn't he mention it? Wasn't even brought up in the decision about uh, converts. So really, it's inconceivable if it really was such an issue in the new covenant, Sabbath keeping as a day, uh, then they would not have neglected to include that, uh, that they would say the Gentiles need to observe a Sabbath day just like we do. 
Now, the, and one of the reasons this is so vital is because I think there's a misunderstanding. There's a common error in the fact that Sabbath keeping and the debate regarding Sabbath keeping, there's this concept that the Sabbath was commanded as a day of worship. That's, that's not scriptural. That's not in the scripture. Nowhere has scripture recorded that I can find where Sabbath day is meant to be a day of worship. There are certain groups in our society now that believe that God requires the church to hold worship service on a Saturday, which they consider to be the Sabbath day, just like some people have done through history based on their calendars. Well, you know, calendars is a whole other issue. We won't even go into that. That's a whole message by itself. So we won't even deal with that or even go there right now. But this is not what the Sabbath commandment was. If you read it, Exodus 20, 8 through 11, clearly details the Sabbath command was to do no work on the Sabbath day, period. That was it. Don't work. Nowhere in Scripture is the Sabbath day commanded to be the day of worship. And I know that may be hard for some of you to hear, but it's, a, it's objective information. It's not in there. Jews in the Old Testament, yeah, uh, yes, New Testament and modern times do use Saturday. Even today is their day of worship. Absolutely. But that's not the essence of the Sabbath command. In the book of Acts, whenever a meeting is said to be on the Sabbath, it is always a meeting of the Jews. If you'll read it, now there were some Jewish converts in those meetings, but they were considered to be Jewish. So it was always the meeting organized and conducted by the Jews, by the Jewish people. So, so then you got to ask yourself, okay, if that's the case, when did Christians, when did early Christians meet then? Well, here it is, Acts 2, 46 and 47. Every day, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts now. That is so unacceptable in our culture now. You try, <laughs> let's, let's get together and worship every day. Who would show up? I don't even know if I would show up. That's when they met. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. We're good at that. We, ate to get, we eat together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the, the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If there is or was a day that Christians met regularly, it was always the first day of the week, which we now show on our calendar as being today, as being Sunday, uh, our Sunday. But it, was, it wasn't the Sabbath, that, who, the Saturday that people considered the Sabbath to be at the time. Acts 27, 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, 2, read that. In honor of Christ's resurrection, in honor of the day that Christ rose from the dead, the early Christians observed the first day of the week, which we now consider to be Sunday, not as the Christian Sabbath, that's not what they thought or even taught, but as a day to especially and specifically set aside to come together corporately to worship Jesus Christ. Now, that's interesting. That's very interesting. So this is really not considered a Sabbath in the New Covenant. This is considered Worship Sunday. This is our day to worship. This is our day to come. This is not a day to fulfill some New Covenant covenant commandment to earn your salvation. And I know that's weird, but because you've always been told, well, you better go to church or you're going to hell. How's that? How is that? Sure, it's valuable, believe me. Coming together and worship, didn't we connect with God? Don't you feel like you've connected with God and worshiping here this morning? It's so vital, it's so important to strengthen us and fill us back up and give us what we need, the, uh, almost an energy, a spiritual energy boost to go back out into all the stuff we have to face each and every day. And it strengthens us. It brings us closer to each other and closer to God. But it's not Sabbath day, it's worship day. And I hope you get what I'm trying to communicate. Is there anything wrong with worshiping on Saturday? Well, no. Is there anything wrong with worship, worshiping on Sunday? No. We should worship God every day. 
We just happen to get together on a certain day. We choose Resurrection Day to get together to worship God. But many churches today even worship on Saturday and Sunday. When I first got born again, we worshiped on Monday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. Who did that? Yeah. So it's like, which one's Sabbath? Well, I don't know. Probably none of them. I guess it was Tuesday when we didn't work. But I hope you get the point. It's okay. Uh, so, so if there's, there's nothing wrong with picking a day for worship, as Romans 8.21, 2 Corinthians 3.17, Galatians 5.1 communicate, there is freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom, not condemnation. Not if you don't do this, you're going to hell. Freedom in Christ. You've already fulfilled the stipulations for not going to hell or not being saved from, from being uh, rescued uh, from yourself. You've fulfilled that already. Uh, uh, should a Christian practice Sabbath keeping then? That is not working on a Saturday. Well, if a Christian feels led to do so, go for it, I say, and I'll support you 100%. If that's what you think you need to do, I'm behind you all the way. If a Christian feels led to do so, Romans 14, 5 will, will confirm that. However, those who choose to practice one day of Sabbath keeping should not condemn those who do not do the same thing. Colossians 2, 16 confirms that. Also, those who do not keep one day of Sabbath should not be a stumbling block to those who do. 1 Corinthians 1, uh, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Galatians 5, 13 through 15 sums up everything. You, my brothers and my sisters, were called to be free, but do not let your freedom uh, indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law, Jesus said this. He's just repeating what Jesus said. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Wow. I think Dan alluded to this one time. Christians are the only species who devour each other. And we're so good at that. We have heard an example of that kind of sitting at a table, a Dairy Queen. It's like, wow, we just devour each other. So we've, we've established that, at least that much truth, that, that much element of Sabbath keeping, a day or one day of Sabbath keeping. Uh, let's go a little bit further into that. Hebrews 4 then speaks of Jesus as our Sabbath, our rest. Specifically, our Sabbath rest speaks of Jesus that way. Verses 9 through 10 in particular. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Oh, it's, it's, I'm doing what Dan said in my head right now. I am dancing. And there's people with me. In Matthew 12, 8, Jesus declared himself Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus did not. I had to be a smack in the face to everybody, every Jew, at least Jewish person listening. He equated himself with God, the Father, becoming God in human form. In addition, Jesus declared in Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man, for the Sabbath. And there's a whole message in that. Because Jesus being our Sabbath, our Sabbath rest was not, well, oh gosh, I could just go into home. All right, let's, let's turn it back. Here we go. Hebrews 3 and 4, let's jump there because we could, a whole discourse about that. But Hebrews 3 and 4, the author developed for us the concept of Jesus as our Sabbath rest. What? Yeah, Jesus is. This, is. this is the revelation of how a relationship with Jesus Christ frees us from the works of the law, which happen to include one day set aside. Remember? That was part of the law. Frees us from the works of the law and allows a person, a human being, to actually rest in the work of Christ to forgive sin. 
ultimately, those who believe in Jesus are going to spend eternity in a Sabbath rest with him. And you can read about that in Hebrews 4.9. When does that Sabbath rest begin? The moment you accept, believe, and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's when Sabbath begins. Wow. So how is Jesus our Sabbath rest then? Well, the key to understanding this, uh, for me anyway, uh, goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning, the word Shabbat, Sabbath, that word itself. Which remember, it means to rest or stop or cease from work. When God, remember, when God stopped after creating everything, Genesis 2, 2, after everything was complete, the perfect number seven, completion, after everything was complete, he stopped. Doesn't mean he was tired. It doesn't mean that God needed a rest. I mean, we know God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. Uh, he has all the power in the universe. He never sleeps. He never gets tired. His most demanding expenditure of energy does not diminish his power one bit. I don't know how that's possible, but that's who God is. So he doesn't need to rest. He stopped. He ceased from his labors. This is important in understanding the establishment of not only the Sabbath day, but most importantly, the role of Christ as our Sabbath day, as our Sabbath rest. God used the example of his resting on the seventh day of creation to establish the principle of the Sabbath day rest for his people. In Exodus 28 through 11 and Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15, God gave the Israelites this fourth commandment. And we've all read about it and heard it, but the fourth of his Ten Commandments. And what did he say? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. One day out of every seven, rest, stop working, give and give that same day of rest to your animals, your servants, everybody, everything, stop working. And this is not, remember, it's not just a physical rest. It is a cessation. It is a stopping of labor. Stop. Don't work. Now, the result of that, of course, you're going to get some rest, but do not work. Whatever work they engaged in was to stop for a full day. Stop. The various elements of the Sabbath, then, symbolize the coming of the Messiah. And that's really the purpose. The fulfillment of the law is so fantastic if you just look at it. If we just look at all the prophetic. And I think you're looking in the women's group, you're looking at Jesus in Genesis. And this is this happens to be just part of that, not on my purpose or my intent, but God's intent. The various elements of the Sabbath symbolize the coming of the Messiah who would provide and who does provide a permanent Sabbath, a permanent rest for his people. On the seventh day, God rested. <laughs> the, the seventh day for us started when Jesus ascended to the Father and sat down at his right hand. What does that signify? I'm done from my work. I'm resting. I am the Sabbath. I am. The work's done. Cease from your labor. All these elements, the example of resting from our labor always comes into play. With the establishment of Old Testament law, the Jews were constantly working. We've talked about this so many times in the last few messages. They were constantly laboring to make themselves acceptable to God, which is what we do. A part of what we do, we constantly labor or work to make ourselves acceptable to God. And in, within that uh, attitude of work, we consider going to church, going to a church service, part of that scenario. We think, well, if I'll just go to church service, whether it's a Saturday or Sunday, whatever day it is, if I'll just do that, then I will be working to make myself acceptable to God. Eeps, wrong. You've already been made acceptable. Sabbath's already happened. Sabbath rest has already happened. The reason we get together is to celebrate that acceptance, to celebrate our new position, to worship and praise the one who did the work and is now resting from his work eternally. Because the work is done. It is finished. Wow, wow. Well, I did get loud, Dan. <laughs> Can't help it. I think that's why they wore robes, because you can move around a lot easier. Can you imagine a robe with cowboy boots? That would look really cool. 
<laughs> wow. I mean, we know, we, we keep talking about this, you know, the civil law, the ceremonial law, the temple law, all these lists of do's and don'ts, uh, and we t- we've talked about this extensively, that they were trying, that we still try to do to ourselves, and we can't keep all those, you never could, never will be able to, we can't. So God provided all this stuff, these sin offerings, all these things for people to, to reconnect with him so they could come to him for forgiveness and restore fellowship, but it was all just temporary. And I know I'm repeating this from two weeks ago, but I can't help it because it's so important in understanding Sabbath and Sabbath rest. They began their physical labors uh, after one day of rest, and their physical labors were offering sacrifices to God uh, to be acceptable. Even their physical day of rest was something they were offering to be acceptable. If we could only be accepted. Hebrews 10.1 explains that the law can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, endlessly year after year, can never make perfect those who draw near to worship. Can never do it. But these sacrifices were offered in anticipation of the ultimate sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, on the cross, who, after he had offered one sacrifice of sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, Hebrews 10, 12. This is going to be just a few minutes longer than usual, and I'm not apologizing. Just as he rested after performing the ultimate sacrifice, which is what Jesus did by sitting at the right hand of God, he sat down and rested. He ceased from his labor of atonement because there was nothing more that needed to be done. Just as in creation, God stopped on the seventh day. There was nothing more that needed to be done. He was completed. He was done. It was time for Sabbath. Jesus completed his labor. He's done. It's time for Sabbath. Jesus was sent so that we could rest in God and what he has provided and stop the work. Stop working for it. Sabbath rest. Sabbath keeping. Stop working for it. Once you really grab a hold of mercy and grace, you'll do that. And the changes in your life, you'll see you didn't have to work for it in the first place. The changes that the Holy Spirit starts working in you and the people all around you, you realize, wow, if I'd have let him do this a long time ago, I wouldn't have been in such a mess. Stop Sabbath rest. Stop working. Another element of the Sabbath day rest which God instituted, which of course is a foreshadowing in Christ, is that he blessed it, he sanctified it, and he made it holy. There's nothing more blessed sanctified and holy than the day you come to Jesus and the day that you accept him as your Savior. Remember your Sabbath. Keep it holy. Remember when you came to him. Keep it holy. Remember, the scripture tells us a thousand days, you know, or a thousand years like a day. Days like a thousand years to God. What is a Sabbath-keeping day? It's your entire life. When you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, Sabbath begins. Hmm. I I don't know how. There's so much more information, but that's what's hitting me. Uh, He alone is holy. Jesus is the only one who's holy and righteous enough for that to happen. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin uh, on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that we might experience Sabbath keeping, Sabbath rest, which is ceasing from our spiritual labors and resting in him forever. Not just what we consider to be a 24-hour period, but forever. Jesus can be our Sabbath. What the Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 8, as God incarnate. The Sabbath was made for us, not us for the Sabbath. Jesus is the principle that the Sabbath rest was instituted to relieve us of our labors. So, gosh, did you just see all this stuff? I'm skipping. It's awesome. Wow. But, but there's, a, there's an insert. I can get you transcripts. You can 
because there is a whole lot of information, but, but it, it does boil down to this. And uh, Tracy Durge actually sent this out a uh, message there by this morning. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, what did Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you Shabbat, Sabbath, because I am the Sabbath. Praise his holy name. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. Come to Jesus. And I know a lot of you are, in fact, most everybody here should be born again, but, but take time now as we talked about last week, to touch Jesus, to touch Jesus and answer that question. Should I keep the Sabbath? Yes, you should keep Jesus first in your life. That's how you keep the Sabbath. That's how you experience Jesus fulfilling the law. He fulfilled the Sabbath by becoming the Sabbath. And if you will just find that for yourself, Stop working for your salvation. Stop. Keep the Sabbath. Rest. Jesus is the only place you'll find Sabbath. Amen.